Very good. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, this uh, research to you. Uh, I've joined the Virgo group uh, through the ICCUV a couple of years ago, and uh, I have to thank all the members of this wonderful group for giving me this very warm welcome. Uh, it's been a great journey for me, and it's, I'm really excited to be here to tell you about what we've been busy with. Uh, also recently joined the Uh, I've also recently, is, is that better, Wendy? Yeah. The Einstein Telescope Collaboration. And I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of my talk. So as you've probably heard, uh, we've detected gravitational waves a few years ago. And this has triggered uh, an enormous revolution in the way we understand the universe. We have a new way of understanding uh, a plethora of phenomena. And we're very excited to be really just scratching the surface uh, of this new of this new scientific avenue. Uh, so if you've ever been to a gravitational wave talk, uh, mostly outreach probably, uh, they all begin kind of like this, with this beautiful narrative that we've detected gravitational waves coming from uh, a galaxy far, far away. So there's two black holes with uh, about 40 solar masses. They've been dancing around each other for a billion years or so. Um, we don't know exactly, but at some point, they got into the, the band of the LIGO interferometer, and we were able to detect this collision that liberated a gigantic amount of energy in the form of gravitational waves. So of course, this is not the way we see this. And if you show this to some of your friends that are not uh, physicists, they may think that this is coming from a telescope, but it's not. This is uh, an artist's depiction of what happened, uh, the actual data looks uh, like this. So this is very different to the video that I showed you before. Let me walk you through this plot in case you haven't seen it before. So we have three panels of information. Uh, the x-axis is time. And the scope here is less than one second. So the signals are really, really short. And perhaps even more impressive than that, is that on the y-axis we have a quantity called the strain, which is the way we measure gravitational waves. This is how we express our, how we express our measurements uh, in a dimensionless quantity named strain. The scope here is 10 to the minus 21. So these experiments are incredibly, incredibly precise. And well, the reason why we have three panels here is because at the time of detection, there were two interferometers um, active, uh, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston in the US. So these interferometers, in case you haven't seen them before, there are two like an L-shaped arms that are four kilometers long, and they shake when a gravitational wave uh, passes through them. And the way we measure that is through the strain. So the data is very noisy, but you can see some sort of wiggle here, and this wiggle uh, has this corresponding wiggle in the other interferometer, so you can overlay them, uh, accounting for the, the time separation between the two, and well, you get uh, a good agreement between so you know it's not just a glitch in one of the interferometers. So this is the data that we've collected, and we somehow managed from this data to build this beautiful narrative of what's happening in a galaxy very, very far away. And the question is, how do we know, right? How do we know from this data here that the narrative behind it is the two black holes? So this how do we know uh, has two parts, or we can conceptualize this how do we know in two parts. Uh, one of them is detection, so we need to make sure that this is actually a gravitational wave. And also, very importantly for um, to understand this black holes in detail is how can we compute the parameters of the black holes that are, that are emerging? So just to give you a very short story of this, uh, what we use for detection is a technique that was developed in signal processing named match filter. I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this, but basically the idea is that you have a data stream that is very, very long, right? So this is your data with, that is coming from NASA, so of course it's very noisy. And you have a template that you have to slide through the data point by point by point by point, and you compute the correlation between the data and your signal. 
And at some point, that correlation will have a peak. And if that happens, you detect it. So the template is like the filter, and when the filter matches something that is uh, hiding in there, you detect it, uh, your gravitational wave. Similarly, but not uh, identically, when we do parameter estimation, we do Bayesian analysis. So we start with some idea, with some prior uh, of what the event looked like in terms of the individual masses of the black holes, the spins, and so on and so forth. And we have a huge template of those, uh, a huge bank of those templates, each for uh, different parameters. So essentially, we just do a, an optimization problem comparing each individual uh, template to the actual event. And we compute different probabilities, and the probability that is highest is the one that we assign to the parameters of that event. So either if you're talking about detection or parameter estimation, to try to answer this question, how do we know this is what happened, it's very clear that we need a model. We need a very good model uh, of the expected, expected gravitational waves. And we're in luck because we have a theory theory that we now love that we've been testing in many other circumstances, which is, uh, of course, general relativity. And in general relativity, we know that we can produce gravitational waves if uh, a couple of masses uh, are orbiting one another, for example. And so this creates ripples in space-time, and we will detect those ripples as gravitational waves. Um, we have a way to quantify these ripples through Einstein's equations, of course. Um, here we're dealing with uh, black hole binary, so there's no matter, even simpler. So we just have g mu nu, the Einstein tensor is over here. Okay, so uh, just to give you a flavor of how we do it, I'm not going to solve any equations in detail because, well, I need a computer and a lot of electricity. Uh, but I'm going to use a blackboard. I brought my own. Here's my blackboard. Uh, we need to do uh, a few things. We need to follow a series of steps. So the first step is that we have space-time here. Uh, space and time are married in this theory, and we want to think about an evolution problem. So it's something evolving in time. So the first thing we need to do is somehow artificially split space and time. So if you're a Pythonista like me, you'll probably laugh at this joke. So you have space-time here. You split it into space and time. There's a well-defined procedure to do this. So, of course, in the theory that symmetry still exists, but manifestly you're breaking this just so you can solve this as an evolution problem. Right, so you've done this, and now what you need to do is to specify initial conditions. In every dynamical problem, you specify initial conditions. And here, well, basically you need to tell, um, to give the metric, this uh, object here is the metric of space at a certain time, corresponding to two black holes that are set in collision. So the two black holes have certain parameters like spins, masses, initial velocities, and so on. And if you specify this, you're in business. You can start uh, your simulation. Uh, of course, the most computationally expensive part is the dynamical problem. So Einstein's equations <coughs> describe the evolution of the system, which is basically the time derivative of the metric, equal to some complicated right-hand side that I'm not going to bother writing explicitly. Um, and if you work very hard, you can solve this dynamical problem by solving this complicated partial differential equation. Assuming that you've done it for uh, the time range that you're interested in, the fruit that you can collect is the string, is the quantity you measure in the interferometer. This is some sort of, again, comp relatively complicated function of the metric at infinity. Here, at infinity means far away from all the action where these two objects have collided. So you go sufficiently far away, you make sure that this behaves as a wave, and you can compute the strain from your simulation. So okay, uh, we know how to do this since uh, 2005, more or less. We've done uh, lots and lots of simulations ever since. And here's a movie, just to give you a flavor of what they look like. So you have two black holes that are set in collision force, and they will orbit one another. I'm afraid you won't be able to see this part here. This is the corresponding strain to the action that is happening uh, up here. But uh, I can, I'm gonna try to follow this with this. So the black holes originally they're in spiraling, so they're moving in on a more or less circular orbit around one another. Here you have uh, 
a measurement of the curvature and the field lines. And here you see that at this point of the orbit, thank you, Valentin, that's better. This is basically just a sinusoid, a sinusoid that is increasing frequency. Whoa. I'm being sabotaged. Okay, right on time for the best part. So here the black holes will merge. Their event horizons will fuse with one another. This is the time where the frequency is the highest of the in spiral. This is where the peak of the gravitational wave is reached. After that collision, you form a wobbly black hole that shakes off until it reaches its final state as an equilibrium state. And then you don't emit gravitational waves anymore. But that whole process has been inserted in the strain of the gravitational wave. And this is what we expect to measure. This is what we've measured. And this is the way you produce this in a simulation. OK, so it looks like we're in business. We're just going to do lots and lots of simulations because we have a theory and we, we, just, we can do this. We know. It's a well-defined procedure. But this is ridiculous. Just don't do this at home because it's incredibly expensive. Moreover, the parameter space that you need to cover is gigantic. What do I mean by parameter space? Not really um, parameters in the theory. The theory doesn't have any free parameters, but the parameters in the initial conditions. So all possible ways that black holes can collide, that is a huge parameter space, and you cannot really expect to do this by brute force. So just to give you a, a flavor of how expensive these are, a uh, simulation like this can take from days to weeks in numerical relativity, uh, and you need about, well, less than a million of them for a decent template time. So forget about it. And parameter space um, for intrinsic parameters for a BBH, this is like 13 dimensions. So yeah, this is a big no. So the way we do this in practice is by use approximations, or if you want to be fancy, just call them approximants. This is the word people use in this field. And well, it's not a crispy picture of Einstein, but it's like eh, more or less a good picture that might help identify um, Einstein, well, a human at least. And this is, of course, an art, right? You, how do you model this is bottom up? We have to decide exactly how to do this, depending on what we want to do, depending on the level of noise of the interferometers, etc. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, I'm going to tell you about one of the methods that I'm working with, uh, which is called the effective one body uh, method, approach, algorithm, whatever you want to call it. In Newtonian mechanics, one of our first courses, uh, we have the two-body problem. We know we can solve it exactly by doing a change of coordinates or change of variables and writing it as a particle moving in a potential well. So here the idea is very simple, except that, of course, there's no closed solution. So you start with two black holes that are orbiting one another, and you replace this problem by one test particle that is moving in an effective metric. Of course, you don't know the exact form of this effective metric. You know it up to some free coefficients that you have to then calibrate against some numerical relativity theory. So this is complicated, but people have been developing this for uh, 20 years or so, perhaps more. And it really pays off because you can reduce your computational time, of course, sacrificing some accuracy from weeks to seconds. So it really, really makes sense to try to do this. This way is wh how you can build your template banks. So, well, bad choice of words here. So uh, the way I'm, the reason why I'm showing this is because I want to emphasize that the role typically in uh, gravitational wave physics is to use numerical relativity simulations to inform these approximate models. You cannot really expect to do detections only doing numerical relativity. You need this bottom-up approach. Good. Uh, OK. So I've told you that parameter space is huge, uh, but we've made some detections. So that means that we understand at least one corner of this parameter space. And I'm going to tell you now uh, the, parameter, the range of parameter space that we know. These are called the quasi-circular boundaries. So why quasi-circular? You know that in Newtonian physics, you can have circular orbits, right? But if you have on top of that gravitational radiation, what's going to happen is that the orbits will shrink. So you start with a circular orbit. They that orbit emits uh, gravitational waves, and the circular orbit shrinks. So that looks 
more or less more or less like this. So we've got the trajectories of two black holes and two different colors, and well, they go through a number of orbits until they merge. And the strain corresponding to this trajectory looks like this. I'd like to thank um, Juan Trenal for giving me his data. He did the simulation in a cluster here at UB. This took how many days, Juan? Like three days? A couple of days. A very, very low resolution. So maybe you can tell here that resolution. But OK, we got a, a decent result just for testing purposes. So this is the kind of wave that I showed you before. So we have a clear separation between the different stages. We have here the in spiral. Here we see the merger and the ring is very nice. Uh, this is what we understand. And this is compatible with uh, the narrative that usually you hear. So this is what is expected from a stellar stellar binary in isolation. So there's two stars that probably co-evolved for a long, long time. They got rid of any excess angular momenta they might have had, any eccentricities, and they form the circular binary, and they form uh, a black hole uh, at the end. These are most events so far. So we've detected about 90 events so far in LVK, and most of them follow this sort of uh, explanation, this paradigm. But well, of course, uh, I'm being here uh, emphasizing the word most, because not all events can easily be explained in this, in this way. Of course, there are some challenging events. That's why we're here. Um, uh, my favorite one is the intermediate mass black hole. Um, it's intermediate mass because the mass is very high, a lot higher than what you expect from a stellar binary. And it looks more or less like this. Uh, I stole this image from uh, my collaborator, Rosela Gamba, and, and others. So the signal is very short. You see there's less than a tenth of a second here. And this is essentially a merger and something else. It's just a bleep. And this is not really compatible with the previous explanation, or maybe it is, but it's also compatible with many other things. So we need to try to understand these challenging events um, a little bit better. And in order to do that, we have to consider other parameters that have been neglected so far, or well, barely, barely touched upon, uh, which are eccentricity and precession of the orbit. Eccentricity, well, it's just the, the classical notion, well, suffice, instead of having a circle, you have a very eccentric ellipse. And precession is what ensues from the misalignment between the spins and the orbital angular momentum that makes the wave uh, wobble a bit. And you have to understand that. And why do we care about understanding this? It's because we can understand all possible channels in which black holes have been formed. The, there's a whole diversity of stories, and we need to model them appropriately if we want to hope to detect them. So just one slide uh, of what I'm doing. So of course, I'm doing numerical relativity simulations. Uh, in two different scenarios. So the first one is dynamical captures. Uh, this is the opposite, basically, of a quasi-circular binary. It's are very close to head-on collisions. And trajectories look kind of like this. So I don't know if you can see the colors very well, but here what's happening is that the two black holes are getting close together, and then they're going away, and then they're uh, flying in together again. And here, the waveform looks more or less like this. So you have some sort of passage, then not a lot happens, and then you get the merger again. Here, well, uh, maybe you can see it. There are two lines here. There's a numerical relativity line in black, and there's an effective one-body line in blue, which, well, they're not identical, but this method is really starting to to pay off. Uh, we're, we're getting good results out of this. Also, uh, in a case where there's no merger, just two black holes sort of fly by, something like this. This is also a simulation. Uh, and here, the waveform looks nothing like a merger. But in principle, these ev events could be detected by Largo Virgo, and people are, are looking into this as well. And we care because we're interested in other possible formation channels. Right. So I want to tell you a short version of what Einstein telescope is, because there's uh, some activity, recent activity regarding this. So LIGO and Virgo have done an amazing job but they're getting a bit old and they're about to reach their maximum sensitivity. And if we want to do more, if we want to do better, we need better experiments. So the new generation of this, at least ground-based experiments uh, is Einstein Telescope. And it has uh, 
a couple of differences. So it's going to be a lot longer. It's probably going to be 10 kilometers long as opposed to three or four. And it's also going to be underground in order to control noise better. So it means that it's going to be a lot more sensitive. Also, of course, this is a drawing. This is not a picture. Because this is projected to begin in 2035, which sounds like pretty far away, but it's not that far. My hope is that right after Sagrada Familia is ready, Einstein's telescope will be ready. That's uh, what I'm hoping. And I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, is that the ICCUB is part of this uh, experiment. We're now officially part of it. Um, we're part of a European proposal that will write a very long set of reports on how this experiment should be built. And we can talk more details about that later. But yeah, we're part of it. I want you to remember that. We're organizing a round table to discuss the scientific case in April, so stay tuned. And these are the take home messages. Um, I want to close with this. So we need modeling, of course, we need very detailed modeling. But the role of numerical relativity is to inform the approximation. We're in the process of generalizing the quasi circular uh, trajectories. And this is a great time to get involved if you're interested in this field. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Tomas. Uh, there is time for a few questions. Uh, yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one question about this event of this uh, intervision of black hole uh -huh. that you show. Um, so the waveform is, is, is a little bit strange. So does yes. it uh, have to do with this kind of hyperbolic encounters or something like that? And related to that, this kind of signals that you are modeling uh, in the case of hyperbolic encounters, uh -huh. this, uh, I mean, I, I guess that it's somehow easy to, uh, to spot one of these uh, events where the frequency is, is increasing with time, but it might not be so easy to detect these issues where you have to deal with which can be confused maybe with noise or things like that. So yes. is it is it more challenging to detect these signals uh, from the yes. test itself? And yeah, can, can you put this it's a little it's bit It's more simple? challenging, that's basically what you said, because they're a lot shorter. So it's not that, let me just flash it. Uh, yes, so it's not that they're incompatible with quasi-circular orbits, they're compatible with many other things. And then you have to do, you know, your Bayesian analysis uh, carefully and make sure that the probability is really highest with this model. So people have conjectured many, many things that could uh, explain this. And well, basically because the data is noisy, it's very hard to, to tell this apart from something else. Okay, there is time for one more question. Yeah, this is just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. but in the in the next um, functions that you showed, the in the so when the black holes almost collided, yes, yes in the dynamical captures, what what would be the time scale of the signals? Uh, yeah, of, of this of this. Yeah, there's a very rich phenomenology here. So mm -hmm. the way we're doing these simulations is that we start with the black hole, and if you shoot them at 90 degrees, the momentum, they go quasi-circular. But if you start varying that angle, you get crazy phenomenology. You can get this this uh, type of trajectories that are called film wheels, because they film and then they wheel. And they can do lots of crazy things. So it's uh, it depends really on the details. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't know exactly what's the what's the relevant time scale here. I mean at the end of the of the wave the quasi normal modes are what govern um, yeah, the, the time scale is given by that. That is basically set by the mass and the angular momentum of the final black hole. But at the intermediate regime, it's, it's very hard. And that's maybe one reason why we need to be really excited that the COB model is doing so well. Because a priori, you don't have any of that information in this more or less capturing that. Thank you. 
Oh, because you can see the trajectory there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this this particular one. But if you instead of using an angle of sixty degrees, so you here I use fifty one, then that can change dramatically. So that's what I was trying to point out. So. 